you. My job is to talk about uh, the treatment in 2008 of the malignant component of this disease. <clears throat> it's not a common disease. We see just under 3,000 cases a year in the U.S., mostly men. The latency periods are all over the place. And frequently, we can't get a good asbestos history on patients. They just don't remember jobs that they had and details of it from 30 and 40 years ago. Many do, of course. <coughs> Median survival runs between 6 and 18 months. Most patients, more than half, are dead within six months if they get only supportive care. Less than a third of those considered for surgery are turned out to actually be stage one. And even with the best, most aggressive therapy for stage one disease, <coughs> surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, whatever, five-year survival is only 30%. And when you figure out now that we're 30% of 28%, et cetera, you're getting down to a fairly small number of patients who survive this disease. <coughs> and clearly for us, getting to surgery in this day and age is where we want to get to with patients. Well, why don't we get there? Because those patients that are alive at 3, 5, or 10 years following their diagnosis They've all had surgery. They may have had other things with it, but they've all had surgery. And why don't patients all get surgery? Well, medical community nihilism. The second people see or think they have the diagnosis of mesothelioma, they hang crepe, which medically means they start preparing the patient and the family for a terrible outcome, <clears throat> suggest that maybe going through a excruciatingly difficult surgery, being referred off, it's at all put up all the con the conflicts and the barriers that they're going to have to go through. And um, don't refer patients on to centers that know how to manage the disease. One of the more problematic things are the quick fix supportive cares uh, tricks that are used. What do I mean by this? Many patients with mesothelioma present with pleural effusions. And those pleural effusions have been followed by family physicians, internists, and even pulmonologists for years without a diagnosis. They get a cytology, and it comes back mesothelial cells or benign, no evidence of cancer. Okay, and they just leave it there. They don't do anything about it. They don't pursue it that happens here, you're going to get a thoracoscopic examination pretty quickly if we don't have a reason why you have a pleural effusion, uh, whatever the initial cytology shows. And then when the patient does finally show up with a malignant effusion, I would say better than half the time the diagnosis is misconstrued and made wrong in the community hospital uh, as an adenocarcinoma of the lung, and the proper tests are not done. Oh, malignant effusion? Let's see, what, pr what procedure are we well remunerated for? Oh, let's put a chest tube in and put talc in there. And they do. And talc works sort of like super glue between the surface of the lung and the surface of the chest. And any of you who think about the, uh, the concept of the surgeon having to separate those various layers when somebody super glued them together <clears throat> can imagine what that does for the patient's uh, operative course. There are, in fact, very few centers with documented track records for treatment of this disease. There are less than a dozen in this country where there are enough people that care about it. You have to have more than a surgeon or more than a pulmonologist or more than a medical oncologist that cares about the disease. You need a team of people to take care of this disease. There are virtually no large standardized treatment trials for this disease. We don't have a literature to turn to. And in my more common role as an advocate for lung cancer, where we like to point out that all lung cancer kills far more people, far more women than breast cancer does, the investment in breast cancer research is tenfold 
the investment in lung cancer research, and the investment in lung cancer research is a thousandfold the investment in mesothelioma research. There are basically two flavors we see of this, the epithelial mesotheliomas, which make up about 50 to 70 percent. And when we talk about curing this disease, these are the patients that we cure. The patients we don't cure are the sarcomatous mesotheliomas. Pretty much no matter what we do, even if they look operable in the beginning, <clears throat> this subgroup of patients does extremely poorly. And I would have to say we're going to have to go back and think, ultimately, as we learn more about the molecular biology of this disease, are these, in fact, the same disease? And it's not clear to me that they are, even though they happen in the same place with the same etiology. Patients present with pleural effusions or unilateral pleural thickening. Um, that's in practice. In our operation, they don't. They have a subtle change in their plaques or a new infiltrate or a new nodule because uh, Mike's been following them for a period of time. They've gotten the follow-up scan. There's a change on it, and within a week, they're in the multidisciplinary clinic here uh, being sorted through. So we tend not to see people presenting like that unless they come in from outside of our system. But this is how they present in the real world, and they always present with shortness of breath. Many of them present with chest wall pain, and of course they present with fatigue, weight loss, anorexia, the usual accompaniments of advanced disease. Here's a chest x-ray of it, and you can see over here the dull blunting of this side. Um, quite frankly, our, my opinion is that the chest x-ray is one of the more useless tests that God ever created. Um, it gives us no particular uh, information. Uh, you're summing a three-dimensional space onto a two-dimensional surface, and you lose an incredible amount of information. It's, of course, the CAT scan uh, that gives us uh, more of an answer. And we see patients presenting in two fundamental ways. We have a lot of staging systems. I'll only briefly mention in a second. But this patient has bulky disease. You can see the whole pleura is lined. There it is. Um, comes in along the, mes along the mediastinum. And there's just an expensive, extensive amount of disease here that makes this uh, a more difficult cancer uh, to resect. And then we see many patients who come in with a lot of fluid but very little bulky disease, actually. And actually, this patient, although his CAT scan may look worse to you as a lay person or someone not familiar with this, has a much better shot at being cured than the first patient does. It is often uh, misdiagnosed. Uh, frequently, uh, it is called adenocarcinoma. And frequently, patients who have adenocarcinoma of the lung or of the pleura are misdiagnosed as having mesothelioma. Uh, adenocarcinoma of the lung, uh, metastasizing to the pleura, can resemble mesothelioma clinically and cytologically. Um, we basically go after a pattern here of uh, CEA negativity is really the first thing. If it's got CEA staining, it's an adenocarcinoma. That's probably the easiest. Um, we use a lot of PET scan and CT scan for initial diagnosis uh, and staging in these patients. The standard therapies include surgery as part of a multimodal package, chemo alone or part of a package, and radiation therapy. <clears throat> radiation therapy has a, an undefined role in the curative setting. Uh, it clearly has a palliative role, um, partly, possibly as part of a multimodality package, but I don't think we have good data on that yet. Surgical candidates have to have disease confined to one hemithorax. If it's in the abdomen, if it's crossed to the other side, uh, it's not, uh, not possible to do that. Uh, invasion of the mediastinal structures or mediastinal adenopathy makes this uh, uh, very difficult uh, to manage and it would not make this a candidate for surgery. Performance status of zero or one, again, for folks who are not familiar with that, performance status zero is absolutely fine, uh, no symptoms, whatever, carrying on your normal activities. One is you're having... You have symptoms, but you're pretty much carrying on your activities. Performance status two, you take a, a nap or go back to rest at, uh, up to half the day. Sort of any of us are performance status two on the weekend, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Performance status three, you're doing that for more than half the day. Performance status four, you're bed confined. And performance status five, you're no longer with us. So zero or one is a pretty tight constraint. If the patient is already quite symptomatic, losing weight, fatigue, the odds that we're going to be able to do surgery are getting real low uh, right out of the box. They've got to have adequate cardiopulmonary reserve. 
And many, many times patients are rejected <clears throat> for surgery, both for lung cancer and mesothelioma, and they've not had an adequate pulmonary evaluation, and they've not had what we call a pulmonary buff. These patients don't just have asbestos exposure. They've smoked. They have a mix of pulmonary diseases. They have the fibrosis and the pleural disease with mesothelioma, but they also have the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease of smoking. Some of their pulmonary compromise is reversible. When you measure pulmonary function, treat with a short course of steroids, antibiotics, and bronchodilators, and retest, many of these patients actually become uh, surgical candidates. When you ascertain with split function studies whether um, the, re the presumed lung that's going to remain behind after surgery uh, in this case, the other lung uh, is sufficient. What you would have, you could actually get away with surgery uh, far more frequently. Obviously, age, someone in their late 70s or early 80s does not tolerate an extra pleural pneumonectomy as well, and histology, a sarcoma, would be difficult. Staging considerations, we clearly have some clinical radiologic and surgical ones, and there may be some molecular ones sooner though than not there. Um, CT exam, poor estimation of lymph nodes with this. Um, we don't see the inferior mediastinum very well, um, and we don't visualize the diaphragm very well. MRI is better for the diaphragm, and it also uh, helps us determine what, whether we have invasion of the mediastinum. It's one of the few instances when we would actually use an MRI for staging in the chest. Um, in the big, larger studies we've had out there, non-epithelial histology, uh, male sex, uh, poor performance status, low hemoglobin and elevated white counts were all um, poor prognostic factors for this disease. Uh, lymph node involvement, uh, you can see here, if you do the uh, extra pleural pneumonectomy uh, and you have lymph node, lymph node disease, that survival curve is dramatically uh, worse. And this is PET scanning. PET scanning is outstanding for uh, determining the ex uh, extent of this disease. Um, much more accurate, we think, than a CAT scan in tracking down where the disease is and pointing us away from patients who um, don't have operable disease uh, and also um, pointing us back to patients who we think initially have more disease than they actually do and who, in fact, are surgical candidates. Um, the extent as it is in lung cancer, and I suspect as we will find over the years, uh, we characterize um, uh, PET scans by their SUV, their, uh, their uptake values here. Basically, this is how bright they shine. Uh, if it's less than four, which is getting down in benign range, and <clears throat> the patient has epithelioid disease, uh, they tend to do pretty well. If they have sarcomatous disease, they don't. Uh, if it's greater than four and epithelioid, they do worse. If you compare this curve and this curve, uh, the, t the top curve and the, uh, the white curve, you will see there's a substantial difference in the ex how much uptake there is on PET scan. And, and the uptake, the SUV, uh, is a marker of how clinically active, how biologically active the tumor is. Uh, it will, I think, uh, turn out in lung cancer and presumably ultimately in mesothelioma to be one of the strongest clinical uh, pieces we have. I will not take you through the staging system. There's a whole uh, bunch of different systems that are usually have people's name attached to them, and then there's an international system. Uh, and it breaks down in the way you would expect it to, which is the sh earlier stages do a bit better than the later stages. There is now some of the work done here by, by Dr. Pass before we went to New York. Um, there's some early work on molecular prognostication. This is not soup yet. It's not ready for uh, utilization uh, as a clinical marker, but I think we will, uh, we will get there over the next 10 years. So right now, the treatment algorithm is they get their work up. If they're stage 1 to 3 and they're operable, um, they'll get extra pleural pneumonectomy. If they're medically inoperable and they have non-bulky disease, they might get uh, observation or go into chemotherapy. And if they're medically inoperable or have stage 4 disease, uh, then they'll go on to chemotherapy. There are a number of re regimens underway, and there are a number of patients for whom supportive care is the more appropriate options. Radiation therapy as private, primary therapy is not particularly useful. The large field that's required takes in too many vital organs. Um, you get radiation damage to the uh, liver, the esophagus, 
uh, and the uh, lung that's irradiated becomes quite useless pretty quickly. <clears throat> it is useful as, for local disease control as an adjunct to surgical resection for positive margins and, of course, uh, for um, uh, treatment of painful uh, lesions. Extra pleural pneumonectomies, I won't take you through. This is a non-surgeon, but this is a major operation, removal of the entire lung and the pleura and the diaphragm on that side. Uh, it is not for the weak of heart. Uh, there are two series showing that removing the pleura but not the lung uh, look to do uh, essentially the same, um, and there is no uh, difference in the, in the small data that we have. Again, these are not comparative studies. These are groups that were selected for different reasons, so we don't have, this is not a prospectively randomized study, but it's not yet clear whether extra pleuronumenectomy is needed. I, we still prefer it in the younger patients. But if you don't do good cytoreduction, reduction, if you don't get all the cancer, you have poor results no matter what procedure you do. And the surgical results with stage one disease show about a quarter of patients uh, are alive uh, at five years. There are a lot of adjuvant therapies for this, photodynamic therapy, chemo, uh, hot uh, platinum perfusions of the chest, radiotherapy. Um, overall adjuvant therapy improves things a little bit, um, but photodynamic therapy does not. This was Harvey's data from the NCI. There are several other studies that show that. There's the intrathoracic hyperthermic pleural effusions, uh, perfusions with usually platinum or platinum and adriamycin. Uh, this has not been shown to be uh, helpful either uh, in particular. Uh, there are a number of chemotherapy uh, agents uh, that are out there. I think these response rates are from very select uh, small groups of patients. Um, and then we have <clears throat> the phase three trial that leads to our only FDA approved uh, uh, combination in this disease. And I have to say, even though I do think pemetrexid is a useful drug, um, that this study bordered on the immoral. Uh, cisplatin alone has never, never been a standard treatment for mesothelioma. When this study was designed, there was not an oncologist in the country who would sign up to use cisplatin alone as a standard treatment for this disease. But the drug company, with a flurry of activity in this time frame, decided that putting their agent plus platinum against platinum alone was a definitive trial. The FDA accepted this, and so the standard treatment today is pemetrexid, cisplatin, or olympta cisplatin, um, in what I consider an unethical uh, and statistically invalid trial for that reason. This was not um, something, and yet this was how many of the standard chemotherapy agents were approved uh, for lung cancer as well. Uh, we've had an induction chemotherapy and surgeries, and, and but by the way, olymptosis platin does work in mesothelium. We get some nice responses with it. It's not an unreasonable regimen, whether it's any better than gemcitabine cisplatin or carboplatin or any of another a uh, series of these is unclear. There are not enough cases to really run those trials. We've had a preoperative chemotherapy uh, trial uh, going forward. Um, not clear yet whether that's going to pan out as with the data is being analyzed now. Uh, there are new combinations, olympta and gemcitabine, maintenance therapy uh, with, uh, with various agents, um, the better monitoring with biologic markers, uh, specific antigens, elimination of asbestos, more awareness, et cetera. Um, again, we need to find this disease early. We don't have a chance unless the disease is found early. And so I think that's where our efforts belong. Um, you can sense our frustration at, at dealing this when we catch this at the end of, of the loop. Um, know that uh, uh, I'm trying to think of if there are is another industry that has been as disgraceful and as dishonest uh, and as thieving as the asbestos industry. It's the tobacco industry, uh, and so is a primarily lung cancer uh, physician who does a lot of mesothelioma work. Uh, I share everyone's concern and anger and pain at working with these companies that have put their profit above uh, people's well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you.